here. Welcome to Evolution Hour. Good kitty clack. Analog devices. Typewriters and clocks. Wow, how retro. And don't forget TortukanWordPress.com, the little website that has a lot of the freebie stuff that I was doing, like, yikes, 20 years ago now. Nonetheless, uh, it's uh, still um, entirely satisfactory material. Uh, that kind of leads you into the more recent stuff that I've been doing, which uh, <laughs> is required to bring in a little bit of cash to uh, keep the little process going. Oh, let me get my uh, chat window going in here and see whether or not we've got people coming in. Uh, connection looks pretty good. Let me also get our very, very, very welcome patrons alluded to. Yay. We got some new patron, a uh, Troy Albrecht, who has joined the uh, uh, parade of people who um, think enough of my work to actually plunk down some money every month. And that is mucho, mucho, mucho appreciated. It's um, nice to know that I'm not completely invisible in the world of the internet. So um, we're still in um, our exciting world of Titans. For uh, any newcomers, remember that what I'm doing is going through a creationist book that lacks proper structure for documentary purposes, that doesn't have a bibliography or um, uh, an index or things like that, uh, in such a way that you can kind of get a grip on what's actually being claimed and on what basis they claim it. Uh, this one um, is structured a lot like a pandas and people, which has references at the end of the chapters, but no reference bibliography, which means Right off the bat, if you're curious, oh, do they know about Schmidlap's paper? Uh, you could just rush to the bibliography and look down and see, aha, they do or do not have that. But minus a bibliography, that means you'd have to plow through the entire book, source by source by source, to have a sense of what the hell is being cited and what isn't and how up to date all of that is. So I try to construct a structure of that where in the past couple of books, Nathaniel Jensen's stuff and Rupin Sanford's, um, they're misrepresenting most of the technical papers that they do cite. What's interesting so far with uh, this little puppy is how heavily weighted it is to their own in-house apologetics, where at the moment about half or more of the book is just repeating the creationist material in-house from Creation Ministries International. They have a relatively small number of technical citations that they've been dealing with. I'm hoping that they're going to have more of that as they move farther down into the uh, actual taxonomical stuff. But we'll find out because uh, we have to look at this source by source. So um, we're still knee deep in the whole issue of how many dinosaur kinds there are and what it means to be a working baromenology. And this particular chapter continues to kind of dance around the fact that they don't really have a clear model. It's basically an anti-model. And so they dribble uh, at least a couple of technical papers this time, fortunately accessible. So I'll be able to put the links in for them. Uh, Michael Benton, um, his uh, 2008 paper on how to find a dinosaur and the role of synonymy in biodiversity studies, which is actually uh, about the challenges facing identifying what a new taxa means and how much of the dinosaurs that we think we know are actually variants on forms that are already in there because they're fragmentary and how many are there actually and therefore how can we study larger scale issues about dinosaur diversity none of which incidentally uh, that whole context is not being presented in Sarfati and Tay's book so it'll be fun you can download that cute little paper and actually look through things because they're bringing up lots of issues of individual taxa and context uh, which would have to be accounted for in a creationist baromenology framework, uh, just as much as in an evolutionary framework. Um, much cheekier, however, is um, the other paper that they've cited next, uh, the big study from 2017 by Barron, and I'll be putting a link into that, uh, for uh, the claim, quote, the division between bird-hipped and lizard-hipped may need total revision. 
uh, namely that, quote, theropods should be grouped closer to the ornithischia than to the sauropods, unquote. And they're not going into details, but what that change was actually relating to was the, uh, the dear little Herrerasaurs. Anybody that knows um, the systematics of dinosaurs knows that you've got the bird-hipped ornithischians, your standard iguanodons and, and all of that, where it's related to the hip structure that superficially looked a lot like what a bird was uh, when they were first being discovered in the 19th century, so that name stuck. Uh, and then the uh, Sarishgia, uh, the lizard-hip dinosaurs, that as they found more and more and more of them, especially in the 20th century, uh, quite a few of them, like the Dinonychids uh, and that, uh, have a bird-like hip structure that kind of renders a lot of the terminology of lizard versus uh, bird hip kind of irrelevant. Well, the Herrerasaurs are deliciously vague. They're very early in the dinosaur period. Uh, they're before they're really starting to proliferate as a form, and they've always been hard to classify. The tendency was to view them as kind of more Sarician, even though some of the elements in there are reminiscent of the bird hip dinosaurs. Well, what Benton and company were, or what, uh, well, Michael Benton was involved in it, but Baron is the, is the lead author. Um, it's actually a breakdown systematically, and what they end up doing, which Sarfati and Tay summarized superficially, is that if you've got the um, normal grouping between Sarishia and Ornithischia, now it's looking like the sauropods are off, branching off earlier, and then another group is branching off, and that splits up into the forms that we identify as theropods and um, um, ornithischians. And so what it's implying is that the sauropod group of Sarishians are in an early diverging clade that kind of goes their own way independently of the theropods. And so the Sarishia aren't a big monophyletic blob, but in fact split up as a much more um, specified grouping. Now, what does Sarfetti and Tay have to say about the Herrerasaurs? Nothing. <laughs> and they'll come up anywhere in the book. And so um, uh, what they're basically leaving out is the fact that the very earliest dinosaurs in the Ornithischians and the Sarishians, and of which we break up sauropods and, and the like, um, all look pretty much alike as little small bipedal teeter-totter hipped, balanced uh, critters that I would suggest that if they were to show pictures in detail of these things, it would be extremely hard for the creationists to be able to delineate which kinds they're supposedly in. And the fact that they're not coming up at all uh, in the uh, framework is an indication of the fact that they don't have a model to apply. Um, I'll be able to get a full measure of just which dinosaur taxes they're dealing with, because I've made a point of not just going through in advance. Um, I'll have to eventually catalog just what gets discussed and what doesn't. I'll probably have to add another little branch onto my spreadsheet that I do as analysis on there to see how many of involved. Now, creationists typically see families as kinds these days, with exception of us, because we have to be special. Um, and so you've got maybe 20 some odd um, families of dinosaurs, although just specifically how many there are will depend on how you hair split. And I'm going to be very interested to see how they deal with cetacosaurs and, and uh, protoceratopsids and all of that when they're proceeding from that basis. But that family kind designation thing comes up nicely in our part two, which is a post that Gavin Cox did um, in April of 2022 about some brittle stars, some fossil brittle stars. And they're thinking in terms of identical to Jurassic fossils. Bum, 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 stasis again. Um, but remember, this is an entirely new family of uh, critters that's popping up. And uh, it's riffing off of a 2021 paper that I'll be putting that up. That's open access. And they're also dangling an earlier short bit at CMI on the Brittle Stars, which in turn was riffing off of a Irish Times secondary account, which I'll be putting the link to that too, relating to a 2017 paper by Blake, um, which indicates 
uh, that you've got this little sidebar family and they've actually found a living representation of it. So how many kinds of brittle stars are there? Presumably then how many families? Are they simply repeating the dynamics of um, evolutionary systematics where if an evolutionist decides it's a family, well, bingo, it's a family, poof, a new kind pops into existence or not. Uh, we don't know because they don't really tell about that issue. Neither Cox nor the earlier paper um, explain how many kinds there are. Venture um, cite baromenological literature on the subject. That's because there isn't any. Uh, invertebrates and the like uh, tend to get avoided like the plague. I think in part because they wouldn't have been on the ark and therefore they don't have a brain that's kind of focused in on having to think about that. They have to focus a little more on critters that might theoretically be on the ark as land animals. Uh, but although even there they get into a muddle. Basically, they're just following the systematics of uh, uh, the um, regular evolutionary framework. So, um, we can therefore wonder whether or not there's ever going to be a time when there will be a consensus of barometrological opinion on just how many kinds of things there were. And the fun part will be to see whether any of the younger generation of creationists that are popping up will decide to bite the bullet and go berserk by actually trying to work out how many kinds of arthropods there are and how many kinds of marine invertebrates and all of that within all of these various uh, phyla, um, some of which can involve like in nematodes, hundreds of thousands of species. Um, are they ever going to work that out? They would need to, in principle, every single extant organism is supposedly derived from a created kind created during the creation week 6,000-ish years ago. What's going on? Can they then, or how much of the genetics and the morphological details of these various organisms will they be able to deal with? Or will they be falling into the same trap that we see with the vertebrates where if you start looking close, you find out they're leaving out families and they're leaving out taxa and genera and they're parsing things down, always riffing off of the regular scientific literature for their base. They're not coming up with their own research. They're not doing their own research because virtually none of them are paleontologists and none of them show a staggering familiarity with how to apply cladistic systematics, which in principle, Cladistic systematics should work just as well in a created kind basis. Uh, Michael Denton was uh, was uh, um, implying that that was the case back in the 1980s when he thought that cladistic systematics was undermining the evolutionary dogma. When all it meant was is that um, that cladistic systematics doesn't depend on evolutionary assumptions to make its analysis. And as some um, people like uh, Niles Eldridge have pointed out, you can use cladistics quite effectively to categorize anything, including objectively designed objects like Louis Couture's chairs or uh, cornets in the case of, of um, Eldridge, because he's a cornet player. I, I still have the hilarious image of, you know, Eldridge sitting up and uh, doing it with his cornet. We've never, I've never actually seen him tootle on his cornet. I, I don't know whether any of the baromenologists play musical instruments. Wouldn't it be fun to gather a whole orchestra of evolutionists and, and the creationists, and they could play um, the systematic symphony uh, that somebody could compose. I think this is this is something we should have as a a YouTube project in the future. But I'm not holding my breath on that one. Um, anyway, um, instead, creationists have come up with their own framework of taking the systematic data that's derived by the cladists from their various papers and dumping them into algorithms, which in their models um, are supposed to produce nice, neat, distinct blobs. They typically look like little nested boxes that run up a diagonal that show each supposedly independent kind. Well, the fun part comes is trying to ferret out what characteristics they're using to determine what gets in the categories. And, um, as uh, Jackson and I had pointed out in earlier book in relation to 
uh, how uh, some of these little fun games were going with bats, uh, they just leave out a chunk of data. And they're going to either leave out the genetics or they're going to leave out morphological information or they're going to leave out the, the paleontological examples when you've got them. So um, anybody that has any particular expertise or interest in a particular grouping should dive in there. And if they don't like creationists, then they should look around to see whether creationists have done any work at all uh, in the area in question and wonder why not? What's slowing them up? Uh, there will be a, a, a there's a continuous circle of uh, creationist barominology popping up, uh, new barominological stuff that's in the latest uh, uh, creationist conference that they do like every few years. Um, but it's not an incredibly interesting bunch of output, but it is a fascinating process to watch to see how they're shuffling that. We're going to be alluding to a lot of that in volume two. The rocks were there. I'm not seeing anybody in the live chat, so it's very possible that there's nobody in the live chat. There we go. Uh, we'll see how we deal with on that part. Um, continuing to buff up the later details of what has turned into two chapters uh, on the uh, flood stories and the uh, discussion of searching for living dinosaurs and pictographs of dinosaurs, supposedly, and uh, the hunt for Noah's Ark and uh, the uh, obsessions about soft tissue. Uh, all of those are some of the big high points that are in the uh, uh, what are become, going to become two chapters in the new book, plus a set of appendices that will be only in volume two. We'll be retaining the phyla list, of course, in the geochronology uh, appendix. Uh, the one that we did on the genetic code will only be in volume one. And then we have quite a few chapters uh, at the appendices that will cover the Ark Encounter Kind list uh, and the uh, listing of flood tales around the world and some stuff on the uh, genetics of... Uh, uh, human beings and how that doesn't fit the error at horizon. Also the discussion of, of carnivory and the creationist uh, troubles with that. And then there's a separate appendix that's going to be delving into the creationist uh, whiffle waffling on uh, diseases and parasites and the like. And um, because we're attempting to catalog not just the material in the answers books, uh, but also the sidebars that are going on at CMI and uh, ICR and the various bits, and of course the intelligent design movement to the extent that they pop up in there. Uh, this means that on any particular topic, you're going to have, as best as we can do, a good representation of how far the anti-evolutionists have come in dealing with these various subtopics. And the um, Intelligent designers kind of shy away from the whole issue um, of uh, parasites, for example. Um, I think they don't like to much think about it. But creation is because they have to shrink everything down into that flood box. Um, they, and they also dealing with the idea that those sorts of activities are due to the fall, that they, they're really forced into dealing with it. And what's surprising is how little thinking they do on it, or how much of it is just kind of hand-waving and they kind of move on. Anyway, there's uh, there's only a handful of examples of them trying to fiddle with. Some uh, occasionally would argue that these come from Satan. It's not a popular idea in the creationist model. Uh, the, the approach they have to take typically is that um, now maleficent organisms started out beneficent so everything, including chlamydia, uh, are things that were nicely created, nice, kind, not bad creatures. And then because of the fall, they have degenerated into the terrible forms that we know now. And let's not think too much about it. But uh, the evolutionary systematics, of course, they're uh, in a, a huge number of cases. They're able to work out when things are happening. Some of them go very, very far back in biological history. Others are more recent afflictions that are popping up relatively recently, uh, but still way too far for the 6,000 year time frame. We'll be cataloging all of that, uh, that stuff. A lot of numbers games and dating game stuff in there. And um, um, we're trying to also make it extremely current for some of the little weird sidebars that are kind of popping up in the periphery uh, in the creationist movement that may or may not be picked up uh, later on. Uh, there's a, a little subsection of young earth creationism that um, 
uh, oops, I think I forgot to uh, title the uh, uh, thing. I'm still running off the same title that I had from the previous one. Oops. Uh, we'll have to adjust that when I'll have to edit the uh, title of the thing. Um, we've got, um, yes, no. I suddenly looked up on my thing. Normally, I, I, I correct the, the title of the show before I begin the thing, but I, I was having some difficulties getting into the signal and that, and so left my mind. The title, Titan, Titans 27, Dino Taxonomy and Be Kind to Brittle Stars. Um, I'll have to get that corrected before we get on to the next bit. Anyway, um, all of this stuff, we want it to be as up-to-date as possible, and there's a little sub-niche of creationism that bumps into the ancient astronauts and um, oh, um, uh, Graham Hancock and the super civilizations of the past stuff. There's an intersection between that and some of the creationist movement. And so little things that pop up like the Baghdad battery or the, uh, um, I just discovered a creationist that was lobbing some stuff about this um, weird and weirdly modernistic looking uh, stone ringlet that's got these little valves that up looked up and it's and, it, and at first glance you might think is this some sort of an advanced gizmo that fits into some fabulous technology thing except it's made out of stone found in a tomb and um turns out uh there's been some recent work on it that it's most likely a re uh, a copy in high quality stone of things that are used to mash the gunk up and down when they're making beer in the brewing process and uh, uh, that there are simpler versions of these things known. And this is a more elaborate version and apparently done in stone because it's going to be taken by the pharaoh or into the afterlife. And so you have to have physical representations of objects. That's why you have to have all of your little body parts and uh, all the little servants that you're going to carry with you illustrated on the pictures and all of that stuff. So the, the Egyptians were under the impression that if you perform the right rites, and this wasn't resurrection for everybody, but uh, for those who could afford it, um, you would have you could take it with you. And initially, pharaohs were doing this, and as time passed in the Egyptian culture, more and more people kind of got into the well. We can take it with a stage, and so that mummification process and all of that um, got to be more and more common and spreading farther and farther into the culture. But that's over thousands of years. Uh, anyway, um, the uh, the beer drinking thing came up because they're beer drinking and some holidays that relate around beer drinking and beer drinking and beer as a thing that figures in their one sort of kind of flood story uh, relates to drowning a, a goddess who was making a nuisance of things. Um, they got him drunk on a lot of beer. Uh, and that's that story has often been riffed on by creationists uh, as a as a flood tale. So things connect to things to connect to things to connect to things. Um, little sidebars that also is going to be discussed, you know, the UFO issue that pops up in uh, some creationist circles. It's a very small little subset of people who are obsessed about that. Uh, their model is that they are like demons masquerading as space aliens. Uh, and um, uh, they use apologetic purposes to bring people to Jesus by telling them about the satanic UFOs. That's been a little sidebar niche that's been going on for decades. Um, so it, it's an amazing interconnection of things. And when you move down to that lower echelon of creationists that are starting to get more in the Kent Hovind level, uh, you start getting more and more Looney Tunes material and um, uh, cross currents from one segment to another. Uh, when you get over to Kent Hovind level, you got the whole medical quackery stuff and latril and all of that stuff that's going on at that level. So it's... Um, an interesting subject matter, and, and we want to be as comprehensive as possible to, to, to get the full range of things um, that um, also bring in issues of Islamic creationism and uh, Hindu uh, political uh, creationism and extremism. They have their own set of belief systems independent of uh, stuff in the West that they defend with just the same kind of dogmatism that you find um, that you find the modern Modi government um, linking up with Hindu nationalists in much the same way that um, uh, Trumpistas are connecting up to Christian nationalists here. So you've got a lot of little fun and games going on. And, and at the same time, I'm busy, busy working on the third of the Paralogues uh, stories that um, I'm in a race to see how all of that will work out.
as to when I'll be able to finish that story. I've got uh, for you Fog fans, and remember I put links to all of the books uh, as well as uh, the Patreon account for people who want to join along with, uh, as Troy Albrecht did uh, just this week to uh, help the old RJ plow along. Uh, but the uh, the Paralogs books, I can't say that there's an ulterior motive to it. But what I will say is that they're mystery science fiction stories that reflect my worldview. So it's a secular worldview. There's a world of science and reason and human dignity and all the rest. In addition to all of that historical framework, uh, my uh, I'm somebody that's familiar with uh, Mark Twain and the uh, social criticism and that, and he dabbled with science fictions and that as well. And uh, in effect, kind of a time travel story that, uh, that the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. And like any clever science fiction writer would, it's a way of holding a mirror up to our own prejudices and attitudes in the context of the fantastical tale. Uh, to talk about what it means to have a progressive society. What does it mean to have egalitarianism? What does it mean to uh, treat black people equally to white people and so forth and so on? These pop up as threads in all of his stories, plus he's got a snarky sense of humor. And so uh, I, I like to kind of have that same attitude. You see little ghosts of it in um, Jules Verne himself, uh, he tends to shy away from political cultural things, but he kind of skates around the edge of things. The references to the Sepoy Rebellion, that figure as kind of backstory for Captain Nemo in um, uh, the uh, Mysterious Island, that's socially woke for your 1870s era. H.G. Uh, Wells, who comes from um, uh, a uh, socialist-loving left-wing progressive, scientific, evolutionary-oriented worldview, although he was carrying a lot of cultural baggage. He was uh, anti-Catholicism and some degrees of anti-Semitism uh, and the like complex stuff going on there, all set within that big context of that uh, Edwardian and Victorian worldview that was a world in tumult and produced the world that we encounter in the 20th century. That in the 21st century, we're riffing off of all of the mistakes and gunk ups that were done in the 20th century that ultimately had some of their uh, roots in the um, imperialism of the 19th century and revolutionary movements that were starting in the 19th century. The third book that I'm working on in the Paralog cycle um, has a lot on the tumult that was going on in Russia during the 1870s. That would eventually lead to radical groups that were assassinating the czars and they're connected up with a whole bunch of things that are eventually gonna lead to the Russian revolution in the 20th century. So um, that sense of the historical sweep of things, especially for characters that can get in a time machine and whoop, move to another time to see how things work out, um, is reflective of my notions about how societies work, how uh, the, the importance to the individual at the same time as there are large cultural trends that are going on that um, are kind of happening collectively, not based upon what an individual can do, suddenly switch the gears and move on to other things. So there's a lot of philosophy and, and the uh, notions about the nature of contingency and history and all of that that are lurking behind what I'm hoping are rip snortingly fun adventure stories with a great deal of humor as Phileas Fogg and his delicious wife, Aouda, who could kick butt considerably if you get her cornered. Uh, I would never attempt to throw her down a staircase. No, Siri Babo. And then, of course, our dear mysterious Passepartout, who uh, doesn't come from this planet at all and only looks like a human being. I always will be reminding readers every uh, book uh, about the fact that you're not really a person and therefore the kind of empathy that one human being ought to theoretically have for another wouldn't be applying to an organism that only looks like a person so his empathy is relating to individuals and his affection for them and not because he's the same species as we are so there's things that would be connected up to attitudes about um, human uh, uh, interpersonal relationship you would see in a Star Trek story, for example. Uh, that stuff is also figuring in the thing. Plus, I love a ripping good yarn and I love the fascination of history. And there are so many neat things that are going on in the past that 
Um, I mean, when else can I have a chance to go to the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia that appears in the second book and the uh, Paris uh, Fair uh, Exposition in 1878 that appears in the third book? And we will eventually be including things at the uh, um, 1889, the famous Eiffel Tower World's Fair. And then there's 19, 1893 in Chicago, uh, 1900 again in Paris with uh, when they painted the Eiffel Tower gold and all of that, our Nouveau material. And then you got the uh, St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. I can't pass up all of that stuff. The fun part is to thread a plot to encounter the things in there in fresh and ingenious little ways as to why they're there and what's going on and are they chasing people and doing things and stuff that's going on and have all the different permutations uh, that I can play off of all of that as a plot device. Anyway, um, that um, fills you in on that stuff. If you want some nice fun fiction, then grab the books. If you want the sciencey stuff, uh, grab the science books. Uh, and if you are flushed with money, I want to acquire some of these books to donate to your local library. Uh, I've donated copies of my fog novels to uh, the local library, and um, uh, I'll be continuing to do that as each one of them comes out. Uh, you can do the same in your environment in there. And um, uh, plus, I get a little bit of royalties off of you getting the books. You know, they're also available in ebook format, which is a different uh, setup thing for those with with Kindles. Uh, anyway. Uh, that kind of gets us up to speed on all of that stuff. So we're past half hour. Uh, I probably will start droning on drearily. If not, we had a weirdly warm day today. Uh, it went up to 54 degrees. Uh, that's kind of a weird as these jet streams are whiplashing all over the place in La our La Nina cycle. Um, it's going to be cooling back down over the next uh, few days into our normal temperatures where it should be like in the 30s or 40s. But whoo, boy, was it nice today. Yipes. Um, I, I worry about some of that stuff because it can start having flowers coming out and budding and, and things are unusual. I've noticed the roses last year, the roses were blooming way into uh, um, August, September uh, period. And I think there were even a few that were budding in October. Um, so everything is kind of screwball. I'm not a great um, gardener and stuff, but I can tell that, you know, it, but wasn't this supposed to normally have May, June, July? Uh, so we're in a very exciting world in the 21st century, provided we can have um, politicians who are not effing idiots uh, in charge, because uh, sometimes you can make dumb mistakes that you can't get around. Hello, purple. Greetings, sentient beings. Hello. Yes, the um, uh, it's nice to have somebody in the uh, in the show. I was just um, giving some recaps of what I've been going on with the paralog stories in addition to the earlier part of the show where I was getting you up to speed on the baromenology material from um, how creationists are in such a mess on that. I'm, I'm hoping that the new uh, rocks uh, were there. Volume two will be really useful when it comes to that stupid Ark Encounter kind list. And remember that the kind list that they put up that 1400 is the smallest number of kinds anybody has proposed. Uh, we'll be doing a little summary in the uh, the main book about how um, in the 17th, 18th century, um, creationists were kind of thinking in terms of species level. And that would make it really easy for us to be a created kind because created kinds are species. But as they started looking around and all these explorers were going around and they would start taking naturalists with them, of which the Darwin Beagle episode is just the most spectacular one. Um, they started discovering more and more and more species of everything. And the numbers just were escalating. They actually made a list. Does that mean we have a definition of kind? Oh, well, other than the generic, um, a kind is the thing that reproduces after its own kind. And that's pretty much all they can get. They're aware of the species interbreeding concepts that you find in the biological species thing that Ernst Mayer favored. And they kind of tiptoe around the edges on it. Of course, in principle, you can't figure out how breeding a, a fossil form would be. So they're kind of philosophically tough to try to categorize fossil organisms. And yet they kind of have to do it if they're going to figure out how many kinds there are. Um, but as the number of species started to climb from the ones that were familiar in the kind of barnyard animal context in the Bible uh, to where they've got species 
turning into 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000, and, and up and up and up over and over again, all through the 18th and the 19th century. Uh, by the time you get into Darwin's time, the, the, the thing escalated so massively. Uh, most people only know Darwin went to the Galapagos, don't no, require a species from. Yeah, well, and, or was at least aware of them because Darwin paid close attention to everybody in the same thing. And you find an awful lot of species issues are coming up with Alfred Wallace running in a different section of the world. Uh, there's still Wallace's line, uh, as it's uh, known, uh, wh where he noticed how different the critters were on the uh, uh, Malaysian side of things versus the stuff on the Australian side. And there's kind of like a boundary layer where there's a clear cutoff between plants and animals uh, on one side versus plants and animals on the other side, because there's just enough water land that it's more and more difficult for them to be able to interchange. There's are occasional exceptions, but nonetheless, it's a very distinctive uh, structure and it's still called Wallace's line to this day. Um, anyway, um, the arc, by definition, is a fixed object with a relatively fixed volume, although depending on how big you make a qubit, uh, it's, a, you know, it can veer around in the 400, 5, 450, 500 footish range, depending upon how you view a qubit. And um, guess if you didn't, well, it's not just the dinosaurs, because we have to remember all those other extinct organisms, the land animals, all of those synapsids, those bloody hell mammal-like reptiles that prior to the dinosaurs in the Permian period and that were as diverse as anything you found in the dinosaur environment. So there's a lot of critters going on in there. They tend not to think about them quite so obsessively. There's only one little study that's been done on the synapsids um, that we discussed in the books. Um, and um, that's about it. But they, but dinosaurs are, are sexy. The kids love the dinosaurs. There's movies with dinosaurs. How many movies do you have with the the Moss chops and uh, Svenacodonts and that Nyan and that. So they, they, they don't give as much press and therefore they don't pay much attention to them. Uh, yeah, well, Ken, yes, Ken could have indeed ignored them. Um, he's certainly capable of ignoring a hell of a lot. But dinosaurs are so... Um, kids are going to go to the library and they're going to check out dinosaur books. And they're going to read about millions of years and extinction. And that's going to fly in the face of their young earth creationist mentality, which is why they end up creating things like this. It's not a kid's book per se. It's aimed at a reasonably well-informed, supposedly adult form. It's not a kid's uh, volume, but nonetheless, uh, and beautifully illustrated, well, high quality uh, workmanship on it. But they got to deal with that because dinosaurs are like the gateway drug to evolution in their view. And to some extent, that's a, a legitimate fear on their part, because the moment you start paying attention to dinosaurs and thinking how amazing they are and how you can form relationships between them and how you can start connecting the dots to birds, uh-oh. <clears throat> so it's no doubt, no, no surprise that they've got a couple chapters later on the book where they're trying to blow apart the bird-dinosaur connection. And that's going to be really funky to see whether they're just simply channeling Alan Fiducia, or whether they're paying any attention to material that's closer to the publication date of the book. Anyway, back to my little historical enterprise there about the, the, the number of kinds that were going on. Um, as the number of species began to escalate, by the time you get into 1800 or so, it's kind of dawning on people that want to take their Bible seriously that it's physically impossible to have all the species on the ark. And so there's a movement that kind of is percolating in the backlog that they start thinking that maybe it's at a higher systematic level for the number of kinds, which means they functionally are accepting speciation. They don't think this through all that closely, but that's the only way you can get around to it. If you're starting dealing with genera or families, and even in the conventional sense, kinds were historically viewed as kind of a family level. That was sort of what kinds were. Yes, don't take the Bible seriously. Yeah, there's your problem. Well, when you got down to uh, John Woodmerhap, the Noah's Ark feasibility study in the 1990s, he wasn't exactly too detailed on it, but he's still talking about like 20,000 kinds. Oh, that's a lot. <clears throat> and I'm sure that the, the um, he had a theoretical construct where he looked at a lot of stuff about the sheer volume of animals and trying to figure out, you know, that he could kind of cram them in if he played with the numbers uh, reasonably enough. But he he wasn't really working out a deck plan of them. 
Well, the Ark Encounter is a physical arc. They're actually thinking through how many decks there are, and they kind of go three or four decks, and they figure out how much space and the wood and all that sort of stuff. And so now they're really committed to having to figure out the stalls and that and slot the critters into them. And you ain't going to get 20,000 kinds on board the Ark. So it's no coincidence that they've opted for the approach that they have, which if you restrict yourself to families, um, at that higher taxonomical level, you end up with about 1,400-ish families, even including extinct animals. And if they think maybe dinosaurs are little babies when they come on board, et cetera, et cetera, there's a, a bunch of little dodges they can fit into. Um, the question is, is why are they picking the groups that they're doing? And the thing that was driving me so much nuts, 20,000 times on top. Oh, yeah. 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 They, uh, uh, that would be a, a funky little part on it. And, of course, you've got, needless to say, arthropods, insects, are hundreds of thousands of species and oodles and oodles of families. And so they tend just not to think about them. Um, in some rarefied cases, they might kind of sort of want to bring some, maybe some butterflies or something on board, something like that. Uh, and some issues about, uh, well, they have to kind of indulge in the issues of fish where freshwater fish, would they be drowning in the salt water? Would the salt water fresh fish be drowning if the water got to be too fresh because of all of the waters coming into the sun? Uh, yeah. And so they do a certain ad hoc bit where they home in on fish that can live in a variety of saline environments. And they just extrapolate that willy nilly as if it applies to absolutely everybody. Um, and, and there's corals, there's all that kind of stuff. And they, that ultimately there would have to be an ecosystem of the pre-flood world and then the stuff that's happening in the flood and then how does the stuff survive that and end up in the world we find now? Um, termites are the only animals in the ark with an adequate food supply. <laughs> yes, that's why there's no ark leftovers because the termites just went berserk uh, afterwards. And that also brings up the whole issue about the carnivory thing because there, there was certainly... Um, the tendency in the old Dwayne Gish level creationism to think of uh, carnivory happening after the flood. So now you don't have to worry about tyrannosaurs trying to munch on the uh, uh, critters in the next stall because they're all Gentile docile, uh, gentle, uh, yeah, uh, Gentile, uh, Gentile tyrannosaurs. Yes, they're not Jewish. They're not circumcised. <laughs> um that uh, all of these creatures are uh, uh, being very passive and not violent to one another. And, and then after the flood is over, they all come out there and then go red in tooth and claw uh, after the flood. And that leads to the Tower of Babel and all that stuff. That was the kind of cartoon version that was the case for the Dwayne Gish, Henry Morris creationism of the 60s and 70s. Um, so there's been an evolution of creationism since that time frame, because as you start having some people who do have some credentials in paleontology, Kurt Wise and, and uh, the like, um, that they know enough about things that the Ken Ham form of dismissing um, uh, the critters that look like carnivores, but they're actually melon eaters. And you still find that line a lot at CMI um, that's um, uh, presenting that, but the, the new creationist, you could call them, that's floating around in that. Oh, hey, the Platicus had a nine-inch penis. The foreskin from that could have made a set of luggage. Yes. Ah, oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jackson, who has done a whole show on whale penises, really ought to have a thing on, <laughs> could bring in some stuff on, on paleo, paleo penises. But that, uh, if, if I were monetized, I would, might be running the risk of becoming demonetized, but I never have to really worry about that part. Anyway, um, what you end up then is the, the arc encounter structure is they actually physically have to work out how big the bloody thing is. Uh, they're coming up with um, the need to keep that list low. So that 1,400 kinds is the lowest value I've ever seen in the creationist literature. And at least it is theoretically workable. But that now brings up the uh, blame Shannon Q for that. Yeah, Jackson for everybody known as a whale penis guy. Exactly. Um, the um, issue then is 
why the kinds that they are? Are they simply following the families and why, where are they getting their listing from? Because in some cases, as we're going to be going into in the book, um, systematics from an evolutionary point of view has split some families up and created families that were grouped together as a single group previous to that. John Samford has alluded to a thing in his book uh, where, uh, or Nathaniel Jensen, Nathaniel Jensen, where I encountered an issue of where he is riffing off of some uh, mammal families. Well, these are recently split families. So what were they before? And what are they going to be listed in, in the Ark Encounter? Are they going to be following the evolutionary cue sheet? Well, spoiler alert, pretty much they are. The problem that all of us scholars were into especially people who had never actually been to the Ark Encounter, was getting a list of the damn kinds. Because there they have a picture that you can see on their website for the Ark Encounter. You can see this nice, deliciously un uh, thing that shows the whole bloody thing, but you can't see any detail on it. And um, so it was a matter of how many... Why, why wouldn't they list the bloody kinds? Why wouldn't they put... A, a document up that would meticulously go through all the kinds that are on the ark uh, and the documentation of why they're ch uh, chosen, choosing the ones they do and how they are distinguished and the documentation in their creationist literature to explain all of that. Well, the short answer is they don't have much documentation for it. Bird kinds, aren't they just riffing off of Leitner's 2013 systematics, which basically is just taking the families as uh, kinds. Um, but you can't, see the details because their book, the chart was so blurry. Well, thanks to a couple people, Erica being one of them, and another person who had actually visited the Ark and got some high resolution pictures. Uh, in one case of one of the pictures, there was unfortunately some lens flare in a certain area. So I could not read every single segment of it, but I was able to read most of it. And then Erica's version, and she compiled a spreadsheet, bless her, just like I was doing independently. She has the whole shebang. And so by cross-checking all of those, uh, we've been able to construct uh, a definitive listing of the Ark Encounter kinds. And now we can start looking at what they are. In words of Sean, from when he and Cy Strike toured the Ark, they made shit up. Yeah, yeah. And I was very um, honored to provide some color commentary uh, for those uh, dear shows that he did uh, um, that um, I've been trying to link to as well. I do miss dear old uh, Cy Strike. He was um, uh, uh, a real mensch, as uh, one might say. At any rate, um, the fun part will be to break down. There's been a lot of criticism as to why they're picking the ones they are and how problematic some of them are, and also the order of them. Because uh, theoretically, all kinds by definition are unrelated to each other. They, they're, you can never have a new kind coming from an old kind uh, or any relationships between kinds uh, because everything reproduces after their own kind, period. So... Um, if you've got the list, why are you listing them alphabetically? All kinds are separate. But they're close. And the dinosaur come together and the mammal-like reptiles, they even call uh, together as a group and birds. And they break it down between extinct forms versus living forms, which reminds us of another detail. The whole point of the bloody ark was to preserve the animals. And yet, by their own count, 54% of the kinds go extinct afterwards. So it was doing a piss poor thing. Called my official side, face palm protector. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yes, he he, uh, he was the one that talked me into doing uh, Evolution Hour videos. So if you uh, are thinking, my God, this uh, jerk uh, Downard is uh, uh, plaguing us with these bloody shows, well, he was one of those that inspired me to do all of that, said that I really should be presenting my uh, material to a wider audience so people can see what's going on. on it. So uh, what we'll be having will be a, a detailed breakdown, which what is funky is that within each one of those groupings of mammals, birds, et cetera, et cetera, they're not in alphabetical order. Why not? 
wouldn't, why wouldn't you put them in alphabetical order since none of the kinds can be related to each other, even if you're grouping them as just the mammal kinds? And why are there mammal kinds to begin with? Um, why are you grouping the marsupials together and the placentals together, just like the way evolution is to cluster them together? Um, since they're not in alphabetical order, where are they getting the order from? And what's painfully obvious is they're getting the order from evolutionary systematics, that the sequence of organisms as systematized by evolutionary paleontology, that's the order they're presenting. You can go right down item after item after item after item, and this is the same thing. I've got a, uh, um, I still have to finish off the stuff with the mammals, but uh, if you look at the uh, Wikipedia section on mammals, um, they'll have background checks that break everything down by systematics. And of course, there's actually a couple different versions because there's been some slight adjustments as to what and, and, and consolidations as to which families are which over time. And so they, they, they alluded to various systematics. Only when you can get all the names together can you start figuring out which version of the systematics is the Ark Encounter riffing off of and which ones are they not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, scholars then will be able to play even more of it because it, for, for first time, they'll actually have a master listing that they can riff off of since Ark Encounter themselves don't offer the listing of it. Um, there will be certain sidebar examples as to the very minor areas where there's actually been baromenology literature pertinent to these things and to see whether or not they match up with the Ark Encounter because you've got Ark Encounter representing answers in Genesis worldview. But you've also got their kissing cousins over at CMI that uh, the Sarfati and Tay book reflect that may or may not match up with the expectations of the answer. Uh, oops, our using our uh, connection in there. Uh, no, we're still. No, it's bouncing along. I'm getting some little um, uh, blurbigs on there. Anyway, once the carnivores started eating other animals every time they ate another kind went extinct. Yeah, that's in part the issue about whether or not they're going to try to argue that that's why certain groups went extinct. But why would that apply? Why why aren't the um, predators still around then? And why are why is it curious that whoops that all the uh, use for a moment, but yeah, it's been this slight little thing that was suggesting that there was a problem with the stream. Uh, these things can happen. I'm still running at four bars on my little doodad, so we'll plow ahead on it. Um, we have to argue why that, that's why there's going to be an appendix on that issue about the carnivory stuff. Creationists have evolved over time to where now uh, most modern creationists have accepted that animals prior to the flood were carnivorous and that therefore they're pushing it back to the idea that it's the carnivory came in because of Adam sinning. So there they have to think about how quickly did carnivory develop supposedly in the time after Adam? Well, remember there's only like 1700 years between Adam and the flood <laughs> in the, in the, in the uh, traditionalist chronology. So it's not a lot of speed for that to happen. And you would naturally have to start thinking through the details of, can you defend a proliferation of forms in this context? And why aren't we finding tyrannosaurs and uh, allosaurs and tigers uh, in the same strata as early Devonian tetrapods? Uh, why aren't we finding any of that stuff? Why are they segmented out the way they are? Which goes back to the whole point about the distribution of critters supposedly sorted during this muck up of the flood. Um, and that makes it, as we progress through time and as paleogeography working out the details of past ecosystems becomes ever more detailed and holy moly. I mean, you've seen in the show where I'm often alluding back to technical papers on this stuff and urging people to read them because it's got so much nifty detail about stuff. That, the moment you move over to young earth creationism and look at the nothing burger that we've got, what do the continents look like? What were the ecosystems? What, what were the, the drainage patterns from mountain ranges? What mountain ranges existed? Um, that Andrew Snelling presents just a cartoon. Uh, Kurt Wise presents just a cartoon. 
um, the stuff with Clary and his you know, drainage patterns, and he invents an entire imaginary continent, in, in uh, where, which is actually the the uh, uh, Neobara Seaway that's underwater, and he's into a a, hype, a mesa that the critters are uh, coming into. It's all just absolute flapdoodle, and no agreement between one group of another. There's also been evolution uh, at answers in Genesis. Some creationists, based on how mobile the animals were, why don't we find pterosaurs in the same level? That's another excellent one. Both marine organisms and flying organisms both theoretically should be able to mishmash together. What, what's preventing some stupid pterosaur to fly into the same area where we've got a condor fossil? Why not? Why wouldn't they interact? How come we don't find ter um, uh, plesiosaurs and um, uh, anomalocarids and... Um, uh, uh, whales uh, all slurping together in the same zone. Why, what's preventing them from swimming next to one another? It's, it's a colossal problem paleogeographically. But the point is there's no consensus on the paleogeography. So you've got some creationists. Um, the, the common view is the current layout of continents is occurring after the flood. Now, if you go back to Dwayne Gish era, they were thinking in terms of no plate movement. They weren't plate tectonic people, that they were objecting to this. No, 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 no. So they're envisaging the flood world as looking like the world we are aware of, maybe with lower mountain ranges, so Ararat can still be okay, but basically the same layout. As we've moved on in the decades since, creationism has evolved and they've started to incorporate the plate tectonics pre-continents. So if you go to some creationists, they're envisaging the pre-flood world as Pangaea, and it breaks up into the continents we're familiar with post-flood. But if you go to the Creation Museum, they've upped the ante, and they claim that it's the Rodinia supercontinent that is the pre-flood world, which in the course of the flood, jiggery pokeries around because so much of that stuff is fossil material that would be coming in in the flood. They've got all those little continental wriggle wiggles are taking place during the flood, and then our world comes after that. Needless to say, that's generating a hell of a lot of heat <laughs> and a hell of a lot of, of, of geological shifting that is just preposterous to account for the little fiddly bit details. So no matter which silly cartoon they try to pick up and try to connect up to the present world, they're going to eventually start bogging down on the details and having to get vaguer and vaguer and vaguer. And that's exactly what we're seeing, as far as I can see, anywhere in the creationist literature. So it's a matter of, yeah, they can have a generic cartoon, but it's very, very difficult for them to get detail when they try to move down into the specifics, which is exactly unlike what we see in the regular scientific literature, where everything is just detail, where they can look out the migration patterns of certain hadrosaurs, and they can look at the, the, the paleogeography of lowland habitats versus highland habitats, and they know where the mountain ranges are, and they can work out weather patterns because they can apply some of the technology that we have in working out climatology to paleo environments. Oh, it's just spectacular and delicious stuff. And, and not at all like what's going on in the other world. And they've had decades to work any of this crap out. And the fact that they go off all on their little fan fiction routes at the various groups to come up with stuff is hilarious. Um, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> yes, the um, God saw that the people of the world were wicked, so he used a Death Star on the planet. Yeah. The the, another funky part that we are dealing with as a little sidebar in the new book has to do with that, that whole issue about how wicked were the people in Genesis at the pre-flood time, because all it is is a cartoon that the Bible doesn't describe any details whatsoever. And what's funky is that occasionally people fill in the details. They do fan fiction. Henry Morris does some fan fiction, which we will be quoting. Uh, this, I think, dates from the 1990s or so, early 2000s, where he just makes up shit uh, as to how the in Nephilim were uh, dating with the uh, human worlds and producing all of these little uh, um, demon hybrids and all this. I mean, it's all fan fiction. It's it's claptrap, not to terribly entertaining stuff. And then there's a couple people who have written some books, novels that are based on it, where they just supply endless little fiddly bit details. But the problem is, is there... 
it's like Lord of the Rings where people are smoking tobacco and and they've got potatoes and stuff that's all perfectly understandable for Tolkien from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s era in a world where there's been food crop interchanges for decades and centuries that he doesn't realize that Middle Earth would be identical to what he's used to from a rural farm in Sussex. Um, you get the same problem with creationists who try to construct a world where they've got critters that are from a completely different continent. They've got crops and things that didn't exist yet. They've got just stuff that's just a mishmash and it's just hilarious. We're going to be having some of that in some of the little um, uh, info boxes along the way. Oh, there's just, um, if you find a lot of humor in the, the first book, I think you're going to be finding other rib ticklers in the new one because it's simultaneously preposterous scientifically. And it also is just hilarious to see the lengths that some of these people will go to and with a complete straight face, the kinds of arguments that they tie themselves into knots on. So anyway, we're having fun with all of this. So uh, we are actually at an hour. We've got a full hour in play. Uh, let me put up my advert for... Um, do, 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 our book. And there we go. And it, as I'm well aware, it's very noisy. I'm sorry. So just turn your bloody um, thingy down. There we go. Oh, in fact, uh, oh, uh, Don Giovanni, the um, a thing popped up uh, just today where um, somebody was, uh, I was commenting on somebody who was a Bible, Noah's art believer, and um, they were talking about how God uh, uh, led, had an invitation out to the people of humanity to, to come on to the ark, and they did not heed him and only Noah and the children were saved, etc. Can you imagine, what if they had said yes? How many people were on Earth, supposedly, which is another little detail that we'll be going into is as the creationists have tried to speculate how many people existed pre-flood and, and they go all over the map. My God, Kent Hovind comes up with just hilarious numbers and other people are, are trying to be reasonable and putting the stuff down. But, you know, what what if. 10,000 people had said, okay, I mean, would they have had room on the ark? What would they have said? No, whoa, no, 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 no. Um, as, a, as a narrative story, it makes for a cute movie. Uh, and if you've ever seen the Russell Crowe Noah movie, it's a funky, fun one to see. Actually, I wasn't expecting actually to like it as much as I did. It was, it was very charming. And of course it brings in some of the kind of of uh, mythic elements with these uh, mythical creatures and stuff that were kind of knocking around the edges of the um, apocrypha and the like. Uh, it, it made a rip snortingly clever little movie. I enjoyed it. Um, statistically, 100% of the world said no to the ark. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, it's the post flood migration issue that is utterly hilarious. And so th there's a giant bit of shuffleboard. Uh, that has to go on because there's so many different cultures, including, spoiler alert, the Egyptians, that just can't be crammed into a pre-flood context. So they've got to move all of those cultures down post-flood. And that leads to some hilarity. So anyway, we're past an hour. We've got our adverts and everything all in. A uh, full show is going on. I'll be putting the links in then as soon as the uh, things are operational and everybody stay safe. 
Uh, if you've got problems with weather or other things, flooding, and there's a whole bunch of messy things that have been going on in places around, as let alone people dropping bombs on people, doing all sorts of nasty stuff like that. Um, stay safe uh, and guard against the uh, wooden penguins who uh, man the ice ring around the flat earth. Although I'm sure it's actually taco shaped. I've been trying to tell them that, but they just won't buy into it. So anyway, catch you all next week, everybody.